Um, so it's a similar setup as before where we have the, um, the terminal window on uh, in half a screen so you can actually have it next to uh, next to your actual um, terminal that you're using. Okay, good. So what we're going to cover today um, is um, looking at how DD for HEP uh, defines geometry um, and then how you can modify that geometry and how you can um, write your own detector plugins to define new geometry. So if you have a, a detector that's currently not implemented in, um, in DD for HEP, then uh, this will hopefully be helpful in figuring out where to start. Um, in most people's cases, it's probably going to be modifying existing detector systems, um, and that should also be uh, clear after, hopefully clear after this tutorial. So we're going to have two parts again. The first part is going to be going over the uh, geometry definition itself. How is it defined? Where is it? Uh, where is it located on the um, in in the EIC shell environment? And then we're going to go into a second part, which is how to modify that uh, that geometry, um, both in terms of parameterization and then also in terms of of actual geometry, more more substantial changes. We're going to rely on this EIC shell environment, which we've covered last week. So, so all of what we're going to do today is going to be in EIC shell. Um, so, so that's going to be the first command that I'm going to type here. Um, if you uh, if you were in the last week's tutorial and and you followed along, you should have this directory under your home directory with EIC that has the EIC shell command in it. Um, so you can start EIC shell directly from there, or maybe you've got your shell environment set up so it finds EIC shell no matter where you started from. So last time we uh, we covered this uh, um, very briefly at the end, that's loading the detector environment. Um, so we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail today, how to, how to find where the detectors are located. Um, so in this EIC shell environment, which I'm in because I can see that there's jog Excel here, um, I can navigate to the directory opt detector. So we talked about this last week that this opt directory includes the stuff that we install um, as, as part of the EIC environment inside this container. So if I look in this directory, I'm going to look at this one file per line. Um, actually, I don't need to necessarily say all the, the commands I'm typing here that are also explained in the tutorial on, on the written version. But, um, but you can look in this directory and you'll see that there's a couple of different geometries installed here and then some other directories that are containing um, sort of artifacts that are necessary for running the, the simulations. Um, there's the there's some older geometries here, I'll admit. There's the Athena Nightly built that's still there, which of course hasn't changed since about March or so. There's the Eche Nightly built, um, which is actually the same as the Epic Detector Nightly built. And of course, the Epic Nightly built is the one that's relevant right now. Um, the Eche Nightly built is, is still there for, for backwards compatibility reasons on some scripts. And the Athena Nightly built is just there because we haven't gotten really around to removing it, I guess. And some people are still using it as a, as a reference. Under calibrations and field maps, we store cached versions of, of important files. Um, I'll let you guess what's under field maps. Um, it's field maps, of course, um, and under calibrations, that's where we store, um, uh, for example, the, um, the necessary parameters to do um, colorimetry reconstruction, the, the sampling fractions as determined for a particular geometry and so on. You'll also see there's one script here, the setup.sh script, um, which will load um, a, a particular geometry. So we're going to go and take a look in this uh, epic nightly directory. Um, let's take a look in um, in this directory. So we've got another setup script. That's the one that's actually going to load this particular geometry. And then there's stuff under lib and share. Um, if you look under lib, there's some libraries that are stored here, the epic library and the IP6 library, which contains the geometry um, the compiled geometry plugins, we'll come back to in part two. 
um, if we look under the share directory, um, and actually under the share epic directory, we'll see that that's where um, a lot more stuff is stored. That's where the parameter parameterizations are stored that use the detector plugins that are um, included in the compiled form in these libraries. Uh, may I ask one question here? Why, yeah, sure. why we are using a dot XML format? Why not GDML or some other format? Why is it any specific reason for that? Yes, yeah, so so we're using this XML format because in the, the decision process that led up to uh, um, to the single software stack, we decided to use the um, the, the DD for HEP um, description of geometry, and um, and that uses this XML format. Uh, there are other things that we could use, and and, and GDML is is perhaps one of them. Um, but uh, in our review process, we we discarded GDML actually fairly quickly because um, it does not have support. For some of the things we need in um, in our, our geometry description, it does not have any way of de defining um, sensitive detectors. It doesn't have any way of determining of, of defining detector segmentations. Um, and there's a lot more support, or there is support for everything that we need in DD for HEP in this XML format. There are they are of course similar because they're both XML based, um, but that's probably where the similarities uh, end. <laughs> So um, if, if you're familiar with how GDML is built up, then um, you may recognize some things in XML because they're in, in this XML based format because it's relative, you know, it has the same philosophy of being a, a separation of, um, of, uh, of, of geometry construction from the actual parameterization, um, but, but it is very different. In, in other uh, aspects, because uh, I was saying a uh, root supports GDML reading, but not XML. That is the uh, what. Uh, yeah. That is so, uh, so we're not using the GDML format. If if you have a, a a component that is that is available in GDML, you can include it through this XML based format, but it will not ever be able to be a sensitive detector if you do that, because that that is just not something that GDML supports. So, also a side note, um, this DD for HEP, there's a whole lot of TGO in there. So the interface to root, don't worry about it, it'll pop up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're gonna be looking at this geometry in root, so. Um, okay. Mauter, mm -hmm. the etcher files I'm guessing are like uh, historical reasons at this point. I'll, I'll come back to these, these are indeed historical. So uh, there's still some, um, some scripts that uh, that rely on, uh, you know, wh wh when we made the name change from Eche or, or from Detector 1 to Epic, um, we uh, we couldn't do that just overnight because everything would break, um, everything that still relies on, uh, on the previous naming. Um, so that is something that will disappear over time. Uh, probably in the next release of our geometry, there will be no more um, reference to Eche here. Uh, right now, these are just simply links to the corresponding EPIC file. So um, it's just a compatibility reason there. So how do we load this geometry now? Um, I've pointed out this, uh, this setup.sh script here and this setup.sh script here. Um, so that is going to be how we load the particular geometry in that directory tree um, into the environment. Um, so for example, I can source these setup scripts and I can source it by, by full path name, detector um, epic nightly setup.sh. So that will load explicitly the nightly build of the epic geometry into the environment. Um, and as we did last time, you see that this changes the um, the prefix and the prompt here to indicate that we are we have loaded the nightly build. Um, if you just want to load the default version for this container, you can also use source opt detector setup.sh. Um, and of course, the, the default is the epic nightly uh, geometry build. So, uh, so that's a, a shortcut. Um, if you want to be explicit, uh, you'll want to specify the detector name here um, specifically. And of course, there will be additional 
names that might come up over time. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, um, the, the versioning scheme that, uh, that Athena used, um, we had, for example, Athena Canyonlands, Athena um, Death Valley to, to reference specific detector configurations. I imagine that we will have things like um, EPIC uh, October 2022 to uniquely define what, um, uh, what geometry was used in the October 2022 campaign, for example. Um, so that will be a, a way to ensure that, that we have the, the versioning of, um, of our detector configurations there um, present as well. So um, after loading and after running this source command, and, and I probably should highlight this one because being more specific, more explicit in which detector you want to load is probably going to be better. Um, there's two things that happen. One is, of course, this, this prompt changed, as I already pointed out, but also some environment variables are defined now. Um, and those are crucial environment variables to load the geometry um, for, for multiple reasons. It, it makes sure that we can find the correct libraries um, because there may be other um, libip6.so files on the file system and we want to make sure we find the right one. Um, it ensures that we find the right XML files that correspond to that detector. So um, I will point out a number of these environment variables um, and I'll use echo to, um, to print them to the screen. So one of them is going to be just detector. Um, this will contain the, the name of the detector that we're looking at. If we were looking at the uh, Etche Nightly, uh, in the days when it was still just Eche and it wasn't a link to the Epic um, repository, this would, would be called Eche or it would be called Athena. So it's the name essentially of the GitHub repository where the geometry is stored. We have version, which is the name of the branch um, on that GitHub repository that we're on. Um, so in um, on, we talked a little bit about continuous integration jobs that are run when we um, uh, when you submit a pull request. In that case, this detector underscore version variable will contain the name of the branch that you're using because you're not on the main epic geometry, but you're on, for example, um, MPGD modifications, uh, some branch name. Uh, so that allows us to make sure that you have access to which geometry this is inside um, the container. Um, and there's some other environment variables. We can look at different configurations within the same um, geometry, so within the same detector. Um, as, as we know, in the case of uh, the EPIC detector, we are thinking about different configurations um, of the, the barrel ECAL, so it could be side glass or imaging. Um, we're looking at MRIDGE versus PFRIDGE, so these are different configurations of the same epic geometry within the same development branch. Um, and in this case, within the same main branch. When this doesn't have anything specific in it, it's just the default configuration. So the default configuration with, uh, I think currently with, with uh, MRIDGE and with um, SIGLASS, a colorimeter. All these different XML files you see here correspond to these different configurations. So we can have we can run a configuration with just the vertex detectors. We can run a configuration with just tracking detectors, just time of flight, just uh, EPIC with, this is the EPIC explicitly with side glass colorimetry. Um, we have EPIC with the imaging colorimeter. We can run um, specifically with the uh, far forward and far backward configurations for 18 on 275. We should of course add also the 10 on, on uh, what is it, 10 on, on 100 and uh, the 5 on 41 GEV configuration there, but those we don't have yet. Um, and, and there's some other that are added here to isolate specific subsystems. And I'll come back to why that might be useful, um, but at least originally that started just from a, uh, a PR perspective um, to be able to, to just make nice, nice pictures of, of individual subsystems. Um, if you're only interested in the DRICH, um, and not in anything that's in front of the DRIDGE or behind the DRIDGE, then you could run your simulations with that configuration that only uses the DRIDGE. Um, it would go faster. Uh, in particular, if you're not interested in anything that goes into the ECALs, 
um, you will speed up any simulation significantly by not simulating the ECALs. Now, of course, you have to keep in mind that that also means that you don't get backsplash from the ECALs, which might be a significant background for some detectors. Back to these environment variables, there's one last environment variable and that's um, detector path, which will point just to the directory where all of those XML files are located. So if I combine detector path with detector config and then XML, um, I will find an entry point to the geometry of the uh, particular detector configuration that I, I want to simulate. So these are environment variables for, for the detector. Um, similarly, there's environment variables for the beamline that are defined. Beamline is for historical reasons in a separate repository. So it's treated a little bit separately, um, but we've got beamline, we've got beamline version, um, which is the master branch on IP6. Um, and then we've got beamline path, oops which will point to the, to the directory where the, the beamline variables are stored or the beamline, um, uh, beamline geometry is stored. So those are the, the variables that are set and that allow us to then use this in the future. So um, as, as a first exercise, um, I'll ask everyone to just um, go through this, load the standard environment, check that your env environment variables are set um, and then load one of the other geometries here, maybe Athena, because um, that will be for, for, for sure different um, than Epic, um, and see that that indeed sets the environment variables differently, and then load again the, the um, Epic environment. Walter, uh, yeah? the, the, beam, the beam line by itself uh, returns empty for me. Yeah, same for me. Me too. Um, Beamline by itself when you when you run this one. Huh. Let Both me go them. out of this. It, could it be that we need to update our shell from last week? Um, it well, should not be necessary. Let's see. Hmm. Um, that that should have been working um last week too. So I am a little bit confused why this is happening. Let me. Is there one of these that doesn't work? No? Huh. Um, that is an, an interesting observation. I will make a note of that. Uh, when you run this uh, source um, setup, is uh, does it provide any other um, output or? Uh, I'm looking at the setup shell, setup.sh that I have in, from last week, and there's lots of beamline underscore path config, config version, but there's no beamline itself. Hmm. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I see what's happening. Um, so, so we're actually going through a transition from, from using beamline underscore config and beamline underscore config version to just beamline and beamline version. So at this point, it's actually, yeah, it's, 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 uh, this is actually something that gets inherited from my, my shell, apparently. Um, so you'll have to use beamline config and beamline config version, uh, where you would, where I, I previously said beamline and beamline version. The reason why, why we're moving away, of course, is because beamline config does not have the same role as detector config. Um, beamline config has the same role as detector. And, and we don't actually have any beamline config config, um, which, is, which is why we're moving away from that. Yeah, so replace beamline by beamline config in everything I just said. Um, and this will not have any other impacts in the rest of the tutorial, so. Uh, but can you try eco dollar and then tab? I want to see what are the options available for you in that. Uh, um, I mean, there's going to be way too many variables. Dollar to and tab. Uh, 200. Yes. To, so that's not going to be very useful. 
Um, and, and there will be other environments var variable set depending on the, the calling environment that you use. So clearly, because apparently that's the, the one that I picked up here. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, so let's take a look at what's stored in this uh, detector path um, directory, and and I'm going to use these environment variables here, even though of course I could easily type the path as well, or you can navigate to that path. Um, but I'm using these environment variables because they're actually um, very convenient shortcuts, um, and and we use them a lot, especially in benchmark scripts. Um, because then they work regardless of where you install a geometry, they work regardless of which geometry you use. So if we um, if we write all of our benchmark scripts, which is going to be a future tutorials topic, um, if we write all of them to use these environment variables, then you can just change the geometry, use a different branch, use a different entry point to the geometry, use a different detector even, um, and, and all of it will just simply work. Um, and, and that's, of course, a benefit from a, a, from a, a, a robustness point of view um, in our case. So I'm going to use these environment variables when I even just um, do a directory listing. Uh, it, in some sense, it abstracts away where the geometry is specifically located. So I already pointed out that there's a lot of etche files here, which we can ignore for now. Um, but all of these, because they'll disappear anyway, um, all of these XML files are entry points to the geometry. So they're the different um, detector configurations that we can use. Um, we can look at what's inside these entry points to the geometry. That will give us a first view into the DD4HEP geometry. And I'm going to look at um, the file, the main entry point, epic.xml. But again, I'm not going to type this out. I'm just going to rely on detector config and XML. So that's going to um, show me now the, um, the detector configuration, um, this epic.xml, uh, the main configuration for the, the epic experiment. So this is one of the main, um, well, this is, of course, the main XML file for the entire epic experiment. Um, and, and so that's going to be one of the one of the important files to to have a sense of what's in there. So you'll see that this is a, an XML file. So it has the, the, the typical markup tags from uh, XML. It has different environments. Every environment, when it starts with, for example, documentation, it gets closed with slash documentation. Um, if there is no, um, let me see if there's one here. Uh, some of them will not have a closing tag, but then they end with slash is greater than. So that's a, a fairly st standard um, XML um syntax and you'll see different sections in here there's documentation sections there's include sections where we include specific other files other xml files allowing us to um, modularize the entire description of the geometry we can even you know since it came up we can uh, include gdml files for specific non-sensitive detector components so definition of elements definition of materials um, we can set limits on, uh, on, on how Gen4 does the particle tracking and so on and so on. Um, and as we scroll down here, you'll see we have sections on um, the colorimetry, which is loaded. We have sections where HCAL colorimetry is loaded, where uh, beam pipes are loaded to far forward, far backward region. Um, I skipped the tracker here. I skipped the PID systems, the solenoid. So all of those are different um, I don't want to call them necessarily subsystems because in many cases they include many um, parts. So the tracker includes the vertex, forward, backward, planes, and a, a whole lot of other things, um, even the supports. So, so all of that gets included in sort of a, a tree structure of, um, of different XML files. So sometimes what you might have to do is if you're trying to figure out which file contains the necessary information for, let's say, the, the MRIDGE, um, you would uh, first go to this entry point file, figure out which um, file includes the MRIDGE, um, and then go to that specific file. 
Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to point out a couple of uh, specific files that are important here. The first one is this file, the um, compact uh, definitions.xml file. This is um, the file that includes the overall detector parameterization. So for those of you familiar with the detector menagerie, um, that is essentially the um, detector parameter table that, um, that the menagerie provides. You know, obviously it's in a different format and, and we can take a look at it in a minute here, um, it, it, but it contains the definitions of um, what is the size of the tracker what is the radius, the inner radius of the ECAL? What's the, the inner radius of the solenoid and so on and so on? What's the, the, the Z extent of the solenoid? So that's where those overall uh, parameterizations of the entire experiment are defined. Uh, um, yep, so go ahead. If I want to visualize this dot XML, how to- We'll get to the visualization in a minute. Um, not combine them at the individual one, like if I want to visualize individual one dot yes. XML. We'll come to that. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so this is uh, this this definitions file. Um, that's that's one that's important to highlight, and then I'll point out uh, a few other ones. So we've got this this tracker here, which we're going to look into um, as well to to see what the, um, how the tracker systems are included. Um, and then I'm going to point out one that is a little bit different here, and that's this. Uh, um, let's go to the far forward region here. Um, so this is where the far forward region is included. And as you can see, instead of having this detector path environment variable um, for all of the, the far forward, far backward and central beamline systems, we actually include the beamline path. So that's why um, that's why the uh, um, that's why those variables are there. Um, so you'll you'll also see that here they're in a, a compact directory here. It's an IP6 directory, which is also somewhat for historical reasons. Um, if you're interested in the far forward and the far backward regions, or in the central beam pipe, then um, then those are going to be the the um, those beamline paths are going to have to be set to uh, uh, to the, the to the correct variables uh, to the correct paths um, for any work that you're doing. So let's look at this. Uh... Excuse me. Yep, go ahead. Can I please uh, see the code that you just wrote for this uh, particular thing? Which code? The, yeah, the code that generated that generated this all. So I didn't, uh, I'm just looking at the, at this XML file with less, with the command less. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I didn't include the less and that's, it says permission denied. Okay, so yeah, sorry. <laughs> I will make Thank sure you. that these notes that I'm using here are also posted uh, probably by tonight. Um, so for anyone who wants to go over it, um, that will be uh, that will be available um, for reference. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can I ask a stupid question that was probably asked in the last tutorial? Yeah. Is there a, a way to connect via X? I would like to see this in a free floating Emacs. Um, you can, you can, of course, open, um, is there a way to connect with X? Uh, not, we don't install Emacs with um, X uh. forwarding inside the container. We install Emacs and of course we install VI2. Oops, this, where did I go? Um, i to find my terminal again. Um, so we install Emacs, um, but I don't think X Emacs is installed, no. Um, or is it a capital X? I forget. No. Um, you can, um, in many cases, edit files locally, um, but the, the, the files that are, are, are deep inside and, and, and installed in um, the container, those are, are more difficult to access from outside the container. Um, so, so in that case, you won't be able to open those with an external X Emacs that is running outside the container. Um, we will come back to this though when we run um, this this uh, you know, when we look at uh, the the geometry that's been um, that's been installed in a local uh, git clone of the repository so okay sorry thank you okay um, I'm gonna take a second here and shut up my uh, um, my slack notifications which are 
bothering <laughs> me. <laughs> I don't know if they bother you or if you can even hear them, but they're um, making noises. Okay. So let me reopen that file here um, just to point out that we're going to look at this uh, definitions.xml file, um, which again includes the overall parameterization of the experiment. So I'm going to open that file. I can just copy and paste what's in that include line. Um, so you'll see things like, um, well, standard constants like pi, mil, and inch. So we can use them um, in definitions of detectors. Um, but you'll also see the different parameters that are defined here, constants that are defined. Um, there's a variety of reasons why we define um, certain constants. But in particular, it's going to be interesting to scroll down a little bit further here and, and um, until we get to the point where we're defining, for example, the length of the solenoid, the R min of the solenoid, um, the offset of the solenoid, um, you know, different options for solenoids, which we're not considering anymore in here. Um, and then things like R min of the vertex tracker, um, R max, all of these are to some extent determined by each other. For example, if we say that uh, um, the R min of the solenoid has a certain value, and we say that the, um, the colorimeter has a certain thickness, that implicitly de defines what the R min is of the um, colorimeter. And so that's one of the, the ways in which this, this parameterization in this definitions file is a way um, to, uh, to, to provide some overall consistency to the entire experiment. Um, to the description of the geometry. Okay, um, so that's this definitions file. Um, if there is anything that is essentially at the level of detector parameter tables, it should go in here. If there's a definition of something that would not go into a detector parameter um, table, think, I don't know, the, 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 the width of some supports um, uh, frame that is in some detector, uh, that would go inside the specific detector subsystem file. So, so let's go back, not look well, at this definitions so under, file. On this, yeah. this definitions file, mm -hmm. it looks like some of the values near the top are sort of just like dummy values. Like you just have like zero through 200. Um, which ones are dummy you values? Just scroll down, like like some of them. Well, you don't like it here. All these values are just sort of in order. So right. Um, so these are just names you're trying to define. So so these are names. So so in DD for HEP. Um, okay, let's take a step back. Whenever there's a hit in a detector in DD for HEP, it will get a unique number. Um, it will get a number that is determined by which detector system is it in? And then within that detector system, which sensitive element is it in? Where, where the detector system can sort of define that sensitive element. And this number of the hit um, will uniquely define where it is. It, it will uniquely define for the trackers, for example, which particular pixel it is in. Now, all of that relies on having a unique number for the detector subsystem. So in smaller setups you can you can just use the numbers directly for that detector subsystem id um, but because it is so absolutely important that we don't have any overlap between the, the detector subsystem ids um, we define them ahead of time here um, to make sure that whenever a detector subsystem id is used no one uses something that overlaps with something that's already defined so, um, so this is one of the areas that's important to keep um, to keep clear of overlaps um, in in the numbering scheme because if two um, ID numbers overlap, then uh, it, it would uh, not allow us to uniquely identify from where from which detector a particular hit came. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, this this does take up a lot of space in the file up front here. Um, and, and so we got to kind of scroll past this. There's for each of the detectors, there's a unique ID is essentially the, the, um, the reason for those listings. Uh, so it's a, it is a full simulation. The trial fund for all is a fast simulation. So we have every detail information in DD4F for each detector. Yes. Yeah, all of the definitions, all of the information is of the geometry is defined within this um this dd for hep description there's no there's no need to use fun for all 
Okay, so let's look again at this, uh, this overall um, entry level file. Um, I was gonna, so we looked at this definitions file, which contains the overall parameterization. Um, now we're gonna look at the, the tracker file. Um, so I'm gonna open this tracker file, tracker.xml. Um, and if you look in this tracker.xml, here you see um, how these quantities, um, let's see. Yes. Um, here you see how some of these um, quantities are defined. So, uh, so we define things that are internal to the tracker, um, such as you know, specific angles that are relevant, um, the length, the R min, R max of certain uh, vertex detectors. Um, we define all these quantities, but you also see that we actually use some of the parameters that are defined externally. Um, so in this definitions file, there's a, a, a variable beam pipe R max that is defined. Um, that diameter of the beam pipe drives the minimum radius of one of the end cap trackers. Um, so rather than putting a hard coded number for this R min in here, what we're doing is we're, we're having that quantity depend on the beam pipe R max. It's not that we, in this particular case, think that the beam pipe radius is going to change necessarily. Um, but for some of the other um, dependencies, there is certainly still an expectation that, for example, support cylinders um, might change or that uh, there might be some, some shifts in, uh, in, in certain subsystems. So for anything, for any variables that are sort of in, in that um, range where they, they might be affected by external um, subsystems, it makes sense to have this parameterization depend on quantities that are centrally defined. And that's, that's what we're doing in this this parameterization system here. Um, if I scroll down a little bit further, um, actually, let me go out of this file and let me open the file tracker. Let's see, uh, vertex barrel, um, which is ultimately um, uh, included to describe the, the, vertex, um, the vertex barrel detector. Um, so here you'll see the same thing where um, the, the vertex barrel length is, is used, which is externally defined, is used to set the length of one individual module of a vertex barrel. Um, but then things like the, the silicon vertex sensor thickness, those are set explicitly within this, um, within this XML file because that's not something that anyone else outside of this um, vertex barrel class or vertex barrel description needs to needs to know or needs to use in a, um, in a way that, uh, that they would depend on. So all of what you're seeing now is, is a parameterization. Uh, and I've, I've, I've covered these, these constants and paid a lot of attention to it, maybe too much. Um, the other part that's important is the detector definitions. So in this vertex barrel file, um, you'll see a section that defines detectors. And here is, for example, a place where we define one of the detectors. Um, we pass it this ID, which is what, uh, what Barak was, was asking about. So that's um, to make sure that there's, you know, so we don't have to keep track of, of those numbers in all of different files, but they're all combined in the definitions file. Um, we give this detector a name. We give this detector a type, which is what we'll come back to. That's the um, underlying geometry plugin that will describe this detector based on the different parameters that we're passing to it here. Um, we give this detector a dimension, our min, our max, and a length. Um, and then we can place modules inside this detector. Um, in this case, we place you know, different, different modules. We place three types of different modules. Um, and then we layer these modules. And I don't necessarily know how this is set up, but that's to some extent what is um, required to build up this vertex barrel detector can I ask uh, using the detector plugin that we uh, that we use yeah oh yeah um did you write hand write all of this or is there some kind of ide that allows you some boilerplate generation um this is this is mostly handwritten this is not um this is not generated by uh by some other ide um the the, the best way <laughs> 
the way in which a lot of it is 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 uh, is automatically generated is is copy paste um, to some extent. So um, you know these these files, of course, they don't start off being 150 lines long. They they start off being um, uh, maybe three variable uh, three constants or parameters that are defined, and then one section where we give it a detector, and maybe there's one module. Um, so so they do grow organically as more um, detail is added. So. Uh, so it is not written by some software like CAD or CATIA that designs the geometry. No, it's not. So. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is one of the. Um, so so what it allows us to do. It, so there there's different ways in which you can define geometry, and and this is one of the the questions that sometimes comes up when we're talking about why can't we just export CAD? Um, so exporting um, CAD would result in having in this file, and for example, if you export some um, Gen4 geometry to GDML, you would end up with a file that had has every um, piece of geometry, every geometric primitive, uh, every cube, every every bar, every prism um, as a separate volume in that file. Uh, that makes it very difficult to treat it in, in a way that um, that maintains this, this sort of logical approach of um, a detector which has a certain set of parameters that are relevant for that particular detector. Um, if we export from CAD, we would not be able to change, for example, the layer thickness on the vertex barrel. We would not be able to change um, the parameterization of uh, um, of, of the, the pixel size, for example, in the barrel, in the, the vertex tracker. So, so that's what this approach allows um, is is to uh, to give us some freedom on changing those parameterizations at the design stage. So, I have a question uh, mm -hmm. about this structure. So. If we're talking, so looking at a, a barrel vertex layer, um, that is made up of, of uh, ITS3 elements, of which mm -hmm. each one has a certain size with a certain number of channels. Right. And then there's a support structure and you know cooling, whatever, whatever, whatever. So mm -hmm. is that gonna be added to the Thing that is a vertex layer, or is that going to be more detail in this file as you add more, as, as your description of what is a vertex tracker stave becomes more sophisticated? Uh, does it, do you add extra layers of files deeper down in the definition, or is it, or is it right here that you're going to start adding more and more subcomponents? So in this particular case, as the description of the vertex barrel detector becomes more detailed, the, it, it would make sense to add this level of detail into this file, but in particular, adding it into the underlying geometry plugin that we'll look at um, in the second part of the, of, of the tutorial today. Um, so it's a combination of both adding support here and then adding support into um, in, into the underlying C++ code. There's other cases, of course, um, and, and I think, um, I don't know if Ryan is here. Um, no, I don't, don't see him. Um, but Ryan Milton, for example, is working now on the, on the eCal and, and HCal inserts. Um, so, so that's one of the cases where instead of putting that within the eCal and HCal, um, the forward eCal and HCal detectors, um, as additional detail, where it made more sense to treat this as a separate file um, and then include that insert separately um, with its own its own set of parameters and its own set of um, you know its own detector definition, its own module definition, and so on. So it depends a little bit on the on the particular case that we're looking at. So, I mean, I know Jim Fast was even during the proposal phase was looking for the three detectors that how, given some assumption of what the die was for the fabrication of the chips, how you would lay them out. Mm -hmm. um, and that influenced the, the radial placement of the layers because you wanted to make it fit in an even number or, you know, an integer number of, uh, of things, but that's not in this level at the moment. But you're saying it would be added. 
probably um, I mean, we do add here the number of, uh, of, of, of layers or the number of, uh, of sensors, right? So I, 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 I don't see a definition of what a individual sensor is that rolls off the factory and it arrives in the mail. Uh, so that each of those modules, um, so, so for example, here, there's a thickness of, uh, of a sensor. I mean, if, yeah. if we wanted to, um, yeah, if you wanted to to really talk about you know um, dead space between different sensors, um, then that would be a level of detail that that could be added here, for example, by saying you know intersensor spacing or something, um, and and introducing that. Um, if that's for example the level of detail that that would be uh, would be something to add. Okay. Uh, me, I have one very technical question, like because I am following the tracking meeting always, but uh, I don't know when it designed the geometry in the epic for the epic in DD for Apple. We never discussed about this. Uh, what are the step dimension? What are the material? Basically, who is developing this? I don't know. The I want to know about it. So this is a develop the development of of these files. Um, it's to some extent a, a collaboration between the detector working groups and the software working group. So, so we can help detector working groups in, in setting up the structure here and, and thinking about what might be a good way of structuring it. Um, but of course, we're not the ones who have in the software working group, we don't know what, uh, what the current sensor thickness is. I mean, we also have to attend the, the tracking meeting to, to find that out. Um, so that's where, of course, the, the information from the tracking working groups is, is uh, or from the detector working groups more generally is, is useful. And that's why we, we prefer to develop these kind, of, um, these kind of detector descriptions by someone in the detector working group with the help from the software um, working groups if necessary. Because when I did the geometry, I for the DD for F, fun for all we know because fun for all we designed the geometry. But here I don't understand many things because we never discussed it in the track tracking working group. So I don't know what is the, some of the materials they put there. So it is better if we discuss in the tracking group at some point because then we will be familiar with what is the inside the DD for F geometry. Right yeah. now, the, it's a black box for uh, me, actually. Yeah, I mean, May that's I why we comment? have this tutorial. Maybe Ray has a comment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so Shim, the, 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 the people putting this in DD for HEP are also in the, in the, going to the tracking working groups. For example, Shujay Lee. Um, and, I, and the point is that the information that will go and that is being currently put in DD for HEP will be, um, the same representation of the detector that we have put in, in fun for all the same the same geometry that Ernst um, has done in fast simulations. There might be some some um, small change here and there, but overall, effectively speaking, the, the the geometry will be identical to the one that we have been discussing in the tracking meeting. Okay, so it's one to one correspondence. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and we have coordinated, and Shuji has been working on this, and uh, going to the tracking meetings, and also we've been having private meeting uh, meetings, aligning one to one the numbers in fun for all fast simulations and DD for help. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Bye -bye. Okay. Um. Any other questions? Okay, um, so then let's uh, let's move on and um, let's do a little, you know, another a little exercise because you know not everyone is probably as interested in the vertex barrel tracker. Um, so I would like you to identify. Um, let me just copy and paste this here. Um, I'd like you to identify a a subsystem that you are interested in, um, and then locate in the the, the top level epic.xml file. Um, where that detector would be included um, and see what's there, what's in this endpoint file, like this vertex barrel. Um, and then identify in particular this type field um, that that tells us what the, what the underlying geometry plugin is that is used. And, and we'll use that type um, field in the, in the next part then to, uh, to, to figure out 
where the underlying C++ code is that supports this detector. So, so uh, identify a subsystem and, and work all the way through to that, through determining what the detector plugin is. When you've identified uh, the detector plugin of your particular subsystem that you're interested in, just copy and paste that that detector plugin type um, in the chat so I know that you're uh, you're done with that. Is this going to be in the compact area or, or the high? Uh, that area? would be in the compact area. Yes, likely. I mean, unless you're in the far forward, far backward region, then it it might be in the IP6 um, okay. region. So, yeah, so, um, so Devon, um, I, I would, I would say, take a look in that file and, and uh, identify the types, so just like Jörg and, uh, and Nicholas and so are doing. And I'll come back to the question about um, commenting out subsystems to isolate another subsystem. So. Okay, I see a lot of people uh, are, are finding the types of the de detector system, so that's great. Um, sometimes you may notice that a particular subsystem has multiple um, detectors defined, and, and not everything is necessarily a detector. So, um, so one that I see there is this uh, IP6 cylindrical dipole magnet. Um, that is, is a dipole magnet, um, which is part of that subsystem and is, is treated as a detector because um, the, the components that we implement are, are all essentially called detectors. Um, so regardless of whether it's actually a detector or not, supports are also called detectors if you implement something that is just, um, just support. So, um, so that IP6 cylindrical dipole magnet, there will be underneath there uh, or further down in the file, there will be other detectors that, um, that might have a different uh, terminology or, or that, um, might not be cylindrical dipole magnet. Okay, uh, very good. Um, then I do want to come back to the question from Divin. Um, so is there a template for a minimal root XML file or can you just simply comment out the other subsystems from Epic XML? Um, yeah, so so one way is to just indeed do as you say, simply comment out those, those other subsystems. 
Um, that's a convenient way to do that. There's some that are, of course, already provided. So if you, for example, are only interested in the tracking subsystem, you could do epic underscore tracker only. Um, if you're only interested in the eCal, you can just do, um, I think it's epic underscore colorimeters, um, although I think you get the hcal too then. Um, so there's there's those options. If if that still doesn't, um, if you still want to narrow it down further, you can just comment out or remove lines from epic.xml. The thing you're going to be encountering, though, is that these files are read only in the container. So you're not going to be able to do that um, unless you take a copy of the file in a directory where you can write. Um, so typically a home directory um, or, or this EIC directory, which we've already looked at. Um, we're actually going to do something that is similar to that, um, because when we want to view the, the geometry, we're also going to need to create a file that um, that we have access to um, in, in, a, in a directory um, that is not inside the container. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to visualize now the, um, the geometry. So uh, um, looking at, uh, the, at the geometry, essentially exporting it to a, a root TGO format and then opening it up in a, a root viewer. We're going to use for that um, a little utility called DD Web Display. Um, which exports. It also does web display um, as, as, as it sounds. So it also can open an HTTP server, but that doesn't typically work very well when you're inside this container um, and is, is not the modality where we're going to use it here. Now, because we're using an export functionality, we're going to want to make sure we're in this directory um, EIC in the home directory um, where we can write um, the output from the export command. So I'm going to use DD web display. And if I just do DD web display help, um, it will tell me how I can run this. I'm going to use this export um, command. So I'm going to do DD web display export. And then I'll specify the input. You know, file is input XML file. So I'm going to specify the input XML file. And as I've already done, I'm going to use the environment variables detector path and then detector config.xml to specify the, the entry point to the detector configuration. So what will happen when I when I run this um, is you'll you'll see it do a couple of different things. Um, and I'll let it finish here first. It just takes um, takes only a few seconds uh, in the best of cases. So what it does is it, it loads dd 4 heb um, As you can see with this reference here, um, it, it prints one warning, which we can actually ignore um, for now. Um, you can see it downloads something. I'll come back to that because someone will probably have um, difficulties downloading because they might be on a node that doesn't allow um, downloading from the internet. It prints some debugging information. Typically, we try to avoid having detector plugins um, print, you know, um unidentifiable um information here um so this this might change uh, this is probably just debugging output um and it will have created an output file in this directory the output file will be um, detector geometry dot root um, it downloaded something here um, and actually those are field maps and calibration files so one of the things that is uh, to some extent convenient in dd 4 hep is that we can specify um, external files that need to be um, retrieved for us to run the simulation. So for example, we specify a, a URL with a field map location. Um, when we run this geometry, it will go and find that, uh, that field map location. Um, if it's already there, it will not download it. So if, if someone is, uh, is on a system where, where this is causing difficulties, where you can't download it, um, this field map is actually stored inside the container, so technically there's not really a reason to download it, um, but we're still, you know, working out the kinks on making sure that it doesn't, um, doesn't download every time. Um, you'll notice that inside this calibrations directory that it, um, that it uh, also created, it has stored links to, for example, the ACTS materials map. Um, which it didn't download because that is, is one of the areas where we do use the cached version that's inside the container. 
Now, what we're going to be interested in is this, is this detector geometry um, file, which is uh, the file that we will um, uh, use, which is the TGO export of the geometry um, of the entire EPIC experiment in this case. So I'm going to um, stop sharing here and open a web browser um, to, uh, to show where I can load this file. Um, where is my web browser? There we have one. Um, and I'm going to uh, share that screen now. This one. And I'm going to go to um, the, the geometry viewer that we have on the Argonne National Lab site. Um, this is really just any JS root um, enabled website. Uh, this is one that, that is convenient because we can use it with files that are coming off of the, the detector benchmarks. Um, so it's a URL that you might already have seen before. Um, can you put maybe. it in the chat or vast? Right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, yeah, I should have done that right away. So I'm going to go to that link and there's nothing here it's just a js root interface um, but i can click on the triple dots here to select a local file and you probably don't see the pop-up of my file selection window um, but i will select i will navigate to the directory where that detector geometry root file was um, was saved by the export um, and i will open um, that file and so you see here now detector geometry root is is loaded in my browser You can also um, use other visualization tools, um, but again, I'm using the web interface here because presumably everyone has access to a web interface um, and can uh, can export this this file in a way that then can be loaded um, in the in the web interface. Um, if you start root, you can also visualize this geometry. You can use T um, T Eve in um, in in root. Um, there's some parts that make this a little bit more difficult to to do the 3d visualization inside the container um, so this is one of the one of the things you probably want to do outside of the container so now that i've loaded this file you'll see that default is is one of the entry points in this uh in this root file um, and i can click on that and uh, i can also right click on it choose draw um, and i'm just going to pick this first default draw um, option here to uh, to draw the entire geometry that I've just exported. Um, this will take a little bit because the um, the geometry has has many you know components, so it it will take a while to actually draw it. Come on, <laughs> there we go. Um, so you see that it. Uh, it, it, it's processing all the, the different components, the different faces of the detector. Um, and there we have the entire um, EPIC experiment as, as exported from the XML files that we were looking at earlier. Um, so you see, of course, mainly the HCALs on the outside. Um, there is an icon here at uh, the bottom, this, this uh, second of the four icons, which you can click to toggle the control user interface um, that will give us this controls um, interface here and I'm going to click on clipping and I'll clip in the y direction to essentially cut everything on the horizontal plane I'm going to close these controls again so that allows us now to look inside the epic experiment and you'll see there's there's components that you'll recognize you know the tracking system support cylinders and all that there's also parts that you might realize are missing. Um, so, so you don't actually see any of the, the tracking end caps. Um, there's no modules inside the MRIDGE and so on. Um, and there's actually a, a reason for that. So with all of the components that we've, that we've exported now, um, there's, there's a lot of fine detail that's included there. Um, in particular, for some of the the colorimeters, so the, the, the side glass volumes, um, 
in particular some of the forward and backward colorimeters have a lot of components which essentially overwhelm this this interface a little bit um, it's it's a web interface which so it's focusing on drawing the envelope volumes over drawing all of the the details inside the specific um, detector components so for that reason we often um, export individual subsystems so this is where i'm going to come back to the export of for example the drich only because that allows us to then show the the detail that is present in that drich only i can also navigate this geometry tree here and select for example only the drich and draw just the drich which also shows us that level of detail um, but of course just loading the entire file um, double clicking and, and drawing uh, is, is easier. And if you're just interested in the DRich, that actually makes, makes a lot of sense to, uh, to, to look at only the file that has that subsystem in it. Uh, Shiam, did you have a, another question? Uh, maybe you can set the visibility level on some point, then it will show full geometry. Sorry, say again? Uh, you can set the visibility level to higher, then it will show the full geometry. I can see the, all the parts here in the geometry. Okay. That's good. Yeah, yeah, you can change the, the level of detail that you're you're showing. Um, so the only other one I'm going to show here is the ECAL barrel. Um, again, to sort of show that um, they're really, oh, well, um, in this case, this is the, the envelope volume of the, um, the ECAL barrel, which we can show um, make that invisible and draw its daughter volumes um, to actually see the different components of the of the ECAL barrel. Um, again, we can we can do things like intersections here uh, so that you can see um, the different orientation of the crystals. Um, one thing you'll have noticed here is that um, we do still have some of these artifacts that are, are due to the limited number of volumes that uh, um, that the that the interface is showing here. So it's essentially stopping drawing of crystals here or, or blocks um, at some point. And it in in that particular um, ring, it is it stopped midway. Um, so so these are indeed limitations of the of the visualization interface. One thing you can try here is uh, right click on Ecal Barrel and click and select all, and that should at least show more. It's not going to show all, but <laughs> well, it's showing more or less. I don't know. Um, yeah, so there's different ways in which you can you can play around with this visualization. I mean, under draw here, you see all the options. If you want a wire screen um, interface, a wire frame interface, then you can also do that. In some cases, that's that's a benefit. Um, you can look at individual modules, um, so that shows you then how that particular um, individual module is, is modeled. So. so as an exercise, um, I'll ask you now to take a different detector configuration, for example, just the DRich only, or, or um, pick one of the other geometries that you, um, you talked to, that you um, looked at before, and only export that geometry, or pick one of those detector configurations that looks like it's, it's closest to, um, to exporting only that uh, set of subsystems. So there's some that are just a forward, um, backward, or beamline region. There's some that are focusing on colorimeters. There's the DRich. Um, there's the tracking systems. So so export one of those and then open that in the in the Geo Viewer to to verify that um, you have indeed just exported those components. How do you open a file from inside the Geo Viewer? I started doing a search and then I then I got back to the beginning and I can't see how to actually search my directory tree. Um, so it would be under this this triple dot. Ah, uh, okay. It is possible. I think I don't know if this is still a, an, an issue, um, but uh, sometimes if you reload the same file um, with the same file name, even though it has different content, the interface doesn't realize that it's actually a different file. Um, so you may have to just refresh the entire page so it forgets about that file um, and then reload that same um, detector geometry root file. Now, then the files that we just have been working with, they're in uh, 
the user local or are they in the directory where I was actually working? So the XML files are all under this opt OPT um, okay. directory, yeah. yeah, opt detectors. Um, when you wrote the exported root file, that would have been in, in the home directory or in home EIC, um, if you follow the directories that, I, that I've been using. I would like to ask one question here, more detailed. Uh, what exactly is converting XML to this root file? What is exactly process is happening behind? Which software exactly doing this? Uh, um, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. So <laughs> because I want to use it, uh, let's say if I know if I XML file, I can convert uh, anywhere in root file, but. If I know where it is exactly. Mm -hmm. um, let me let me uh, respond to some of the questions here in the chat. So Lauren, I will stop sharing this screen um, and share my terminal screen again. Was there anything in particular you wanted to see on that screen? Or this command to DD web display? Um, and then Jörg, ah, um, so, so Jörg is, uh, is, is running into um, an issue that is, that is relatively common. So we cannot export individual detector components in that compact directory because they rely on um, the parameterization that is, that is essentially at a parallel level to them. So that's why at the top level under detector path, there's these different configurations. So if I look at, you know, it's actually good. I have the, um, the, the, the terminal here. If I look in detector path, this file epic sciglass.xml. Um, in this case, it actually loads um, the epic detector with the sciglass, uh, the entire epic detector with the sciglass colorimeter. Um, if I look at, for example, epic colorimeters, it would just load the colorimeters, um, but it loads first the parameterization and then the colorimeters. Um, if you were to load directly um, this compact ECAL side glass or whatever it's called, ECAL barrel side glass, um, what you would encounter is indeed that um, uh, it, it cannot find, for example, the material definitions, it cannot find the overall size of the side glass system, which is included in that definitions file, which gets loaded by the top level um, system. So I, does that make sense, Jörg? Yeah, so I, I, I followed you. I, it seems to be working now, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So we can only do the DD web display on these ones that you're showing here, these XMLs. Right, they can only be done on the top level files, yes. Okay. Um, it's easy to ensure that there's more of these. If, if for example, you wanted to have a, a side glass only um, detector or, or a side glass only entry point, um, it, it's relatively easy to just add that. We have a, a little bit of a, of, of a system for that that is using templates to ensure that um, these are all consistent with each other, but we can add files to that. And I think, I think Chris, Dilks has most recently added one of those to it. I forget, maybe someone else did as well. Um, but that is certainly something we can do easily. Uh, in the online notes, are you going to um, post an alternate way to view these root files uh, besides the online viewer browser? Um, I think the alternate way, so I'm going to just start a new terminal here and because I would want to do this um, from outside my um, my container because it's, as I mentioned, it's uh, OpenGL um, processing. So the, the graphics acceleration would probably not work inside the container. So I could start a root session that opens this detector geometry dot root. Um, and then I could 
um, you know, you'll see that it, it has this default in here as well. So it's essentially the same, um, the same root file. I mean, it is the same root file. Um, so I can start a T browser um, and I can see this geometry in here, um, that same world volume. Um, and then I could probably figure out a way to draw this, although I'm actually not a, a great expert on doing it this way. It may be that there's, oh, you probably don't even see my root windows. So you can go to the volume and then you can click on the draw, right click and then you can show the open here, OGL. Then it will draw. Yeah, so that's. Uh, or I you can go to terminal, just click on the terminal, uh, just click on the terminal and you can read. Uh, I can probably do something like. Read, no, no, you can do GGO manager, GGO manager, GG, small g, no. Okay. no, no. GGO manager and get top volume and draw OGL. Okay. Um, yeah, get so, so there, there's other ways to do it. Maybe if you can po post it in the chat, what command to use, um, Shyam? Yes, I am writing, yes. So my file, the original geometry file is in something opt detector but I don't, that directory doesn't exist outside the. Uh... That doesn't exist outside the container. That's right. So that's why when we do um, a, uh, when we um, export to this, to this root file, we have to do that in a, in a directory where we can, first of all, where we can write, but also where we can then um, access it from outside the container. That's why we have to export the XML files from that are currently only you know, pre-installed inside the container, but which are read-only and not accessible outside the container. That's why we have to export them to a directory that's also accessible um, from the, the 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 host system that you're on. The next part that oh, we're going to so do what, in the so next. What, uh, um, so what directory should I be in? I mean, I was in in Epic Nightly. I should just be in. So I would say, so I, I did this in the directory, in my home directory slash EIC, um, but you can do this in any directory that you can also access from outside. Um, if you run this DD web display with the full path to the XML file, it, it will not matter really where you run it from. But that's exactly what I did, okay. Um. I just did inside the container, I just did a CD and now I'm in a directory called root. That doesn't sound good. Okay. Uh, that's in Mac, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know where you end up when you type CD on a Mac. Yeah, it seems to be that if you are using the Docker container, at least that's the case for me because I had some trouble with singularity, that you are automatically the virtual root user. As such, when you type CD, you end up in the root, like the root user's home directory, which is slash root. Oh, do you then have to navigate um, to, to slash users or something on a Mac? Yes, what you yeah, I don't know how it, I don't know how the file structure looks like on a Mac, but on my Linux system, well, in WSL, but whatever, uh, it I can manually navigate to slash home and then my username and then I end up there. That works. Mm -hmm. But I am automatically the root user for whatever reason. I'm not sure if this can be adjusted in the Docker container. I can look into it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Docker, that's one of the reasons why, why Docker is typically not used in, in the, um, in, in, on big, um, Excel, uh, on big, um, computational clusters is because of those, um, permissions that require that your, your root. So, um, that's so Docker on a, Docker on a Mac does look like it's running as root, but it is actually running a user space, but it's correct that it, you know, you will be the root user in principle. We could set this up differently. We just haven't done that. Mm -hmm. um, so, Marshall, I see that you have uh, um, an, an, an error uh, related to, okay, I just scrolled off my screen here now. Um, where is it there? Um, so, Marshall, are you running this inside the container? Yes, I was. 
okay that's uh that's strange that uh, it would not find the the libraries um so can you post that in the mattermost channel under the help desk then we can we can try to debug that maybe um copy the command that you've used so yeah i, I can do that Okay, great. Um, so you can try these two commands. I is post uh, on the same directory, then it will draw basically. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I saw you copied them there. Um, so that's uh, um, that. Uh, yeah, I, I think if I if I do this on my um, on my screen here, the the OpenGL window wouldn't pop up anyway. But yeah, so if if the um, if the um, the Geo Viewer web interface is is not something you can use or that's cumbersome because for example you're running this on a, on a bnl or on a jlab system um then you can also use the um the geo manager within root to visualize that with the commands that jm has has posted there i'll add those um to the instructions as well um on the online tutorial so thank you for figuring yeah. that out okay so um as with the last tutorial last week, I'm going to propose we take a little bit of a, a break, five minute break or so um, for everyone to kind of stretch their legs. Um, and then we'll pick up again with a local copy of the geometry where now we're going to look um, at, at an environment where we can actually modify those XML files because currently we're still looking at the read only files. Um, and then we're going to look at the um, the underlying C++ code that actually allows us to parse those XML files. So that will be for, for after the break. And so in the second part, we're going to talk about how to take this geometry and, and really start modifying it now um, beyond, you know, looking at it and then uh, and, and visualizing it. And to do that, we're going to start from a, a new local copy of the, the EPIC repository. So I'm going to check out my own version of this, uh, of the EPIC repository. I'm going to compile it and install it um, in such a way that it looks similar to what's in this opt detector um, directory tree, but in a way that I can make changes um, and, and sort of do iterative development. So I'm gonna go to that same directory. I've done everything in see not with caps lock on um, so in this EIC directory I was already in um, I'm going to git clone the github.com um, EIC epic repository um, if you already have this checked out that's of course fine as well um, and let's look into this epic directory that's been created with this this code and you'll see this actually looks fairly different from what's installed in the um, in this opt detectors location. So, so this is what is used as the source code, in a sense, for installing the geometry under opt detectors. I mean, other parts are, of course, very similar. Um, in this compact directory, you'll see all those same XML files that we saw earlier. Uh, but all of those top level XML files are gone and, and in the break, you know, we talked a little bit about how they're generated from this template based on certain configurations that are specified in this configurations directory. Um, and that will indeed happen when we do the installation of this, uh, this geometry. Um, if I look in this top level directory, you'll see this CMake lists file that indicates that this is a CMake project. Um, or a CMake uh, um, build system. So I'm going to um, use the, the usual CMake commands that you may be familiar with um, to compile this. Um, if you're not familiar with those, they're also in the readme for this repository. Um, so they would be inside this file as well. So I'm gonna do CMake, create a build directory that's called build um, from the source directory. That's the current directory I'm in. That's where my CMake lists txt is located and i'm going to pass one defined parameter cmake install prefix i'm going to install everything in the prefix install relative to the current directory so it's going to make a directory install here um, 
where, where everything's going to be installed. I'll have um, full write access, of course, to that, to that directory because um, it's under the current directory I'm in. Uh, don't use user local or something because that would point to a directory you don't have write access to inside the container. And I'm inside the container as indicated by the fact that my prompt has a, has a prefix here. So this will look up, you know, DD for HEP and all the things I need in my um, uh, container to build this geometry. So that's the first step. And let me just um, leave that there as a command for, uh, for those who are still following along um, or, or are, are still typing that in. Um, so now the next step is going to be compiling it. So now I want to compile um, in this build directory and I'm going to use the install um, option. So, and, and there should indeed be a space here. Um, I'm going to use that so that um, uh, it gets installed in this install directory that I've specified as the CMake install prefix. Um, I have a question. Just mm -hmm. a question, because yep. online on the GitHub repository, there for the CMake there was also uh, the epic HL legacy compact of. So, is that like necessary or like no? Um, another option. So that's this. Um, that's this compatibility layer. So that's what. Okay. That's the compatibility that still installs the Etchy. Um, the 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 it still installs the geometry under the name Etche as well. Um, you can specify that or, or you can you can just leave it at the default. If you specify it as off, you'll see that it won't install all of those Etche um, copies of the geometry. Okay. Um, most likely what we'll do is at the next release of the geometry is we will just set this to, by default to off so that it will by default only install um, the... Oh, thanks, Nicholas. Um, so by default, it would only install the epic names, and it wouldn't install the etchy unless you explicitly ask them to turn that on. So, okay. So I'm going to compile this this code, um, and what it's actually doing is it's going into this uh, this source directory and compiling the geometry plugins that we'll look into um, in a in a in a minute or two here. Um, so this is going to take a while. I'm going to speed this up a little bit by specifying that I want more jobs to run simultaneously um, so that we don't have to wait for this to scroll by indefinitely. Um, so this minus J, um, you specify the number that's essentially the number of cores that you have on your system. If you're on SDCC or on, uh, um, or on a JLab system, feel free to put 48 there or something. Um, and everything will be done in no time. If you're not at those systems, don't put 48 there. May I ask one thing? Normally, mm -hmm. we, we, we call make. Why you are calling CMake to compile this creating the link? Um, because so CMake um, has has a uh, this is essentially using the terminology that CMake uses um, without having to rely on make as a, an additional command. Um, so this is the, the more modern way of doing this. You can also use make um, if, if you're familiar with that. Um, but, uh, but on some systems that where, where make is not available or where you use a different build system, um, a di yeah, it would be, uh, this would be the way that would work whereas make might not work. So. Yeah, suppose that we were using Ninja instead of Make or something, which we are. Right. We could in principle swap switch if we wanted to. Um, and and for example, on people who are using a, an integrated development environment, for example, Eclipse, um, the 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 CMake, this option is also going to be the one that works where um, where Make itself would not work. Um, so if if you worked along last week with the tutorial you might have this epic directory already under eic um so it's perfectly fine to reuse that uh, that epic directory um then you don't have to do another git clone um if, if that's already there um maybe you can do a git pull to update it but it's not even necessary because i don't think there's any changes that happened since last week that are really going to be important so so lauren you can just reuse the epic directory and um and run cmake and and cmake built 
um, and install inside that directory. So as you see here, it has installed um, these files in, under the install directory. Um, and uh, it will have installed it under this install directory just in the same structure that it would be under this opt detectors epic nightly um, directory that uh, that is inside the container except now i have of course full control over these files i can update them um, and in particular i can update some of the source code that underlies it and and reinstall it and it will update update those files you see it has also installed this setup script um, which is going to be the one that we want to source in this case to use our local installation. So I'm going to be doing source install setup, um, and that will load the um, that will load this uh, this epic geometry. You also see that it's warning me that IP6 has not been loaded. Um, I have not checked out the repository or cloned the repository for IP6. So, so that only makes sense that it doesn't actually find IP6. Um, if I look at these variables like beamline config, um, well, uh, those, those would not <laughs> be filled in your case. In my case, it actually um, inherits them from the, from the shell I was in before I started the IC shell. Um, but those would not be set to the right values. In particular, if I look at beamline path um, that is not the right value and it's not even available on this system so so i need to do something about that um, so what i'm going to do is i'm going to source opt detector um, epic nightly setup so this will now set my beamline path to the right location and then i'm going to in source my local installation on top of it which will just set the detector variables so i'm going to use a, a mixture in some sense of the um the, the beamline class beamline geometry that's installed inside the container but with my own geometry um, for epic that's installed in this directory that's installed in this install directory is it is it recommended to keep switching back and forth between setups without exiting the the, the previous variables get confused with uh, new ones or um is, is it recommended um <laughs> uh so yeah this is a little bit uh, a little bit clunky i will agree that uh um we're still trying to figure out what what's what's maybe the more user-friendly approach here um in particular for local development like this um so so is this recommended it's what works now okay but we don't have to worry about interference between no, I mean uh, these one. these setup scripts they just set the variable. Um so so this should they should not interfere if you um you know you have to keep the order straight. That's the only thing. So um and you can always verify what's happening, right? If you now look at beamline path, that's where it's going to find the beamline variables, uh few beamline files and detector path. That's where it's going to look for the detector um, subsystems, and that's in, in my home directory under this um, EIC epic install directory and so on. So you can always verify which one is, is it actually going to use. Um, this, this may change a little bit um, over time and, and hopefully become more user friendly um, along the way, actually. Yeah, we should probably make the setup scripts a bit more chatty so they at least say what they're doing. Yes, yeah, that, that might help. Chatty scripts are good. So, um, uh, but one question: If there's a variable defined in, say, the first one, and then it's not defined in the second one, does that variable survive when you change? Um, yes. If, if, for example, beamline is set by the first one and not by the second one, then beamline will still be set to the variable that was set in the first one. Okay. Um, but otherwise they override you know if something is uh, if a detector um, variable is found it overwrites the detector variables that are set there um, so with this this um, environment i can now use dd web display and export um, and i can actually use this detector path 
um, and I can use detector config.xml. Um, and that's going to use now my detector configuration that's, that's inside um, this install directory. Uh, who, can, who can identify what else is different this time compared to previously? Anyone see any differences? So it's a, it's a minor difference, but previously it downloaded one thing, just a field map. Um, now it actually downloads a second thing, which are those material maps for the, the track reconstruction. Um, previously in the container, it actually knew where to go and look for them and find the local version. Since I'm now on, a, um, on, on a, 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 my own repository, it doesn't have any, any real reason to go and look for those files. And so it has to download them. Um, from uh, from the internet. So this will only work if you're uh, on uh, the first time at least if you have access to the internet to be able to download those material maps. Okay, so um, and you'll see that it has indeed exported the detector geometry dot root which we could then also open um, in, uh, in in um, in the, the geometry viewer. So, um, so I'll, I'll put this exercise up, um, which is essentially going through these steps. So, so make sure that you have a local copy of the, the repository. Uh, make sure that this detector path does point to your correct local install directory after you run the source of the, the setup script. And then verify that DD web display in, indeed exports correctly, um, which verifies that we have our environment set up correctly. So, Devin, um, did you first run, so you're saying that your beamline path and config are, are empty after running source setup. Um, so you will have to first run the setup for the, um, the, the, the installation that's inside the container to pick up those beamline um, environment variables and then run the one that you just installed for your local detector geometry to make sure that it um, that it sets the detector variables correctly. So, so there's two steps involved in this one. Okay, if you uh, if you successfully exported that geometry and it and it is indeed from your local um, local repository, then uh, please give me a thumbs up in the chat so I can uh, I can know that the, that worked. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So now. Um, now that we know how to install our own local copy, that means we can actually start making changes to the underlying um, geometry plugins. So remember when we were looking at the XML file, um, there was this type and all of you picked um, a detector system and identified what the type of that detector system was. Um, that type describes which source file in this source directory is actually used to construct the geometry. Um, that is the part that actually does the geometry construction pretty much um, the way you would do in Jan 4 by creating volumes and logical volumes, physical volumes, and so on and so on, except it does this in um, a more DD4HEP based um, approach. 
remember that in the case that I showed, uh, what we were looking for was, was something that was called epic underscore vertex barrel. Um, and of course, you'll, you'll notice right away, there's actually no epic underscore vertex barrel um, anywhere here. Uh, so the reason why that's the case is because we can actually define multiple different um, plugin types with the same source files. So we're going to actually first have to find which one of those source files defines this particular plugin. Um, and then we're going to take a look at that particular plugin. So I'm just going to use grep um, and search for that in all of those, those CPP files to identify which one has uh, epic vertex barrel defined. Um, source star CPP, there we go. So this is defined in this uh, um, barrel tracker with frame geometry plugin. So let's take a look at that geometry plugin and actually I'm going to open it with nano because I hope that will give us a little bit of a, a pleasing syntax highlighting um, as opposed to just less, um, which is going to be just black and white. So in this source file, this is really what deter what defines the code that is run when we pass this XML file with the vertex barrel parameterization um, to DD for help. Um, and I can scroll down all the way to the end of this file just to show that this is where epic vertex barrel is indeed declared. And, and what's done here is epic vertex barrel is defined in such a way that this function create barrel tracker with frame is called when we load something that has the type um, epic vertex barrel. Um, now there's only one function here, so all of this is really the same. You can also see here how this, um, this compatibility legacy layer um, is, is adding Eche versions of everything that exists for, uh, for Epic. So I'm going to go back to the definition of this barrel tracker definition, barrel tracker with frame um, function, which is the only function in here and which starts here. So that's just the top of the file. Um, it defines one function. And what happens in dd 4 app world is that this function gets past the, the detector um, as it's currently built, um, some sense, the, the, the geometry tree. Um, it gets past the XML file. So we can look at what variables are defined in that XML file. And then it uh, also provides us some, uh, in, um, some way of, of passing sensitive detectors and, and sensors back to, um, um, to dd 4 app so, um, try to exercise with Epic DRich only. Um, so I'm just reading Jörg's comment. Um, so you're just getting a beam pipe in the visualization, is that right? Yeah, that's that's the only thing I'm I'm I'm, I'm seeing. So did the okay. DD, DD web display export? And then I, I I choose the director path Epic. TOF only, for example, or, and the only thing I'm getting displayed then is a beam pipe. Huh. Um, for, okay. for TOF, I think there are no TOF detectors right now implemented. Right. But so there, there is a DRich, so, uh, so I don't know if the DRich is disabled um, in DRich only. Um, I would try the draw all function just in case that it's not descending deep enough. Yeah, all, everything everything worked, I believe. Mm -hmm. So in this function, we're passing this XML file, and so we can query this um, this XML file to find particular variables. So uh, um, we can get from this XML file, which you know, if we if we follow this variable e, which gets called the variable x underscore that, we can get the dimensions. Um, as you recall, in this vertex barrel, one of the um, XML environments was dimension. So this passes the dimensions to this um, to this function, and we can start creating um, envelope volumes. But then it really is just freedom to the to the developer of this this geometry plugin 
to decide how and um, and what you want to support in this this plugin. Um, there, there's a number of different ways in which this can be implemented. Generally, of course, as as with most code, you don't start writing this from scratch necessarily, but you start from um, from an example and then you expand it. Uh, so in this case. I, I, maybe I should ask uh, Sylvester if there's anything specific he wants to talk about in this file because he he wrote most of this, I imagine. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is there? Well, this file is probably the most complicated one that you could have picked for a tutorial. But <laughs> yeah, I, I figure that uh, I because should have picked it. The very first block does loop over supports. Um, actually, it's, it's capable of uh, building arbitrary shapes as for support for the detector. So that's the first part. The second part then constructs the detector modules. And then the final part builds layers out of those modules and constructs them. So there's you know, a couple of big parts in there. Yeah, um, it's true. That one is, uh, is maybe not exactly the, the example I should have used. Let's see um, whether there's one that um, is a little bit easier to get through. Uh, maybe the solenoid, um, which is, as I mentioned, a detector, even though it's a magnet and doesn't actually detect anything. Um, so if we go to a solenoid, um, so this is, first of all, a lot shorter. Um, but it essentially is built up or very similarly. Um, it, uh, it loops over the layers in the solenoid and then places within each layer, it places slices which allows us to have different parts of the layer that have different thicknesses. Um, and ultimately, it, it uh, puts it all into physical volumes and places all of that in, in, the, um, in the detector. Um, so what we're passing to this is the layer information, the thickness of the layer, the size of the layer, the inner radius, and so on. Um, and then we're just constructing things here. Um, most of the code that's involved here is, is essentially um, dealing with the input that's provided in this XML file. Now, for most who are who are here on the in the tutorial, um, I imagine you will not need to write things like this from scratch. Um, you'll start from a detector that's already there, or, or you'll start from a detector that's very similar. Um, so, for example, if you're uh, if you're starting to work on on a uh, on a barrel detector, there's there's both barrel trackers and there's barrel um, PID detectors and there's barrel colorimeters already there. Um, if you're working on a an end cap detector, we've got end cap trackers, we've got end cap colorimeters to have blocks um, that you can start from. So all of that is already there. Um, they may not have the right parameterization. There may be a need that you um, you want to add more layers. Maybe you want to add support for layers. Um, so it will be a, a, a matter of, of looking at different plugins to see what they do um, and identifying which subsystem might already do something that you are interested in adopting as well. Um, so previously, everyone had sort of identified this, this detector type that they were interested in. So, um, so I encourage you now to, to go through and find that particular detector type um, in this source directory. Um, and look through that CPP file. Um, and if it started with IP6, then you would probably want to pick something else um, because that would not be inside this, this EPIC repository. So um, if there is a, um, if, if uh, I think it was just Devan um, who has an IP6 cylindrical dipole magnet, um, but everyone else should be able to find their, their EPIC detector type inside this repository under this source directory. And again, you can use this grep, uh, this one here, um, command to figure out in which source file it is. I have one thing to ask to you about mm -hmm. so because you written the material map generator code because you written that I remember for the no, I... uh, material map for the geometry basically you written the code so i want to ask a little so we have the each detector xml file so basically you runs all over the xml files and then produce the map yes is it like that 
Um, not, you know, not, not, not as directly as that. So, um, so all these XML files load the plugin, the plugin generates the geometry that lives in memory that is in, in the, the DD for HEP structures that can be exported to TGO that can be used to create the same geometry in Jan4. And then we can use that geometry for the, whatever we want. Um, we can use that geometry as input to track reconstruction. Um, we can use that geometry as input to a Jan4 simulation. We can use that geometry as um, input to a visualization. Um, or we can use that geometry to determine how much material is on a straight line when we look um, from the origin, from the interaction point um, in a particular direction. So those oh, are all okay. interfaces that, that use the, the, the dd 4 hep geometry description in memory after it's been loaded by XML. But you don't have to do any of that work yourself. Most of that is already um, provided. At, you know, there's hooks in the dd 4 hep geometry description that allow you to query that information easily. Ah, okay, now I understand. Normally, when I do the in the giant, I then the giant, you know, then I track the whole the particle, then I sum the radius length. But this is basically done by the geo, geo, geo manager, basically, somehow. Uh, uh, yeah, um, it's the, the, it's not the geo manager, it's the DD for HEP geometry manager. But uh, um, if, if you tell me a point and you tell me a direction, um, then the, the, the DD for HEP geometry manager will will return a table with how much material at which point and what radiation length is, is in that direction. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you really have all the options there because if you wanted to do, say, a Giantino scan, which is something we still do for the tracker material map, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any command? Can you post? I can try for one detector if you have some command. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, There's definitely a command that you can type on the XML file that will do exactly that. Oh, is it material scan? Right, that's it, it's, right? It's one of the two, yeah. Um, yeah, so material scan detector path detector. I tried this, but it, this is giving some strange thing. That is what uh, I don't understand. Let's see, zero, zero, zero to um, one, one, one. Um, this will now, should now give a table of all of the materials between 0 0.000 and 0 0.111. Um, uh, you should maybe have picked something outside of the beam pipe. Oh, right. This is in, in millimeters and centimeters, not in meters. I, uh, yes. Um, so that will give us uh, ideally a table. And let me decrease the font size. Eh, that doesn't necessarily work. Um, yeah, so that's what I was worried about. Uh, so you get all the materials. It starts with vacuum, vacuum, vacuum. These are just different different volumes that it's in, even though they're the same. Gold, um, beryllium. There, I kind of like the gold. Is giving me. I don't know if you see that on the screen, but in my case, it shows a gold square now. Um, and so you have all the materials as you go through the um, through the detector system. Apparently, we have air between our tracking layers. Not yeah, the should be sorted by the okay, good. But I didn't um, understand the vacuum. First is vacuum, next again vacuum, and then again next vacuum. This is what I didn't yeah, understand. Yeah, I mean, the next one, these are all um, this short is, volumes uh, of vacuum. This is a detail on how the beam pipe is built. Um, right. For, so it's an annoying idiosyncrasy of an older version of ECTS uh, where we needed to define essentially a vacuum beam pipe inside of the beam pipe because else when the volumes were too close to the tra the first tracking layer it ran into issues trying to determine it, it it's mm -hmm. uh, geometry navigation um that's something you shouldn't have to worry about and it may not even be necessary anymore um, but this was necessary at some point because of the reconstruction that's why the essentially we have a vacuum then we have a fake beam pipe which is a vacuum cylinder inside of there then more vacuum and then the regular beam pipe which is a layer of gold and a layer of beryllium then you have air that sits um, outside of the, the silicon tracker. Then you have the air that is part of the, essentially the silicon tracking layer, which is why there's two layers of air. Um, and then 
Behind that, there's, you know, you have the layer that has a bit of air in it. Then there is the air between the different layers. And then you have the next layer, which consists out of air, silicon and air again. So that's how to understand this, uh, this structure. Okay, 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 thank you. So now I understand. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I hope everyone has identified which source file corresponds with that detector type that you're, um, that you identified as, as the one you're interested in. Um, so I'm going to go and I'm going to use the solenoid one now because it's a, it's a little bit easier to do. Um, if, if you're interested in, in using the same file, you can also use the solenoid. Um, I'm just going to edit this, uh, what was it called? Solenoid geo.cpp. I'm going to make a minor change and then compile it, reinstall the change geometry and then run with that change geometry. So what is a minor change that we can do? Well, it's, it's printing some debugging information. Um, I don't think this has any debugging information in it. Um, and I should have prepared for this by, how do we do info uh, statements again? It's, it's, uh, uh, I gotta go um verify so i don't know how to program off the top of my head either i also need to look at other people's code before i can figure this out um so is there somewhere here someone who does a print statement for uh uh sylvester help me where is the print statement oh there was one there oh this is a format print statement um sorry i, I wasn't paying attention for a second but I print think out was... that's it yeah. thank you yes uh huh. With all these different frameworks that we're using, they all have a different debugging output print statement approach. So, uh, so I tend to forget. So I'm gonna print something here. So, yes, file loader print something. That's true. Um, so I'm gonna print, and I'm gonna call this. So this is in the solenoid plugin, and I'm gonna print layer. I'm going to print something from this layer. Let's see, what are we going to print from this layer? I'm actually going to put it over here. So inner radius is going to be this inner R. So this is a fairly, as I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate, this is a fairly innocuous change to the geometry. Um, I'm going to actually call this, I'm going to give this a higher priority, so I'm, I'm sure it will actually be able to be printed out. Um, you know, this is, this is mostly to, to demonstrate that there's an effect from, from the changes that I'm applying here, right? So I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, save this and go back to my CMake build install and it will recompile that solenoid um, all right uh, yeah the plus is for a string uh, i'm i have to admit i'm kind of winging this here um and i should have uh, should have probably prepared something here a bit better than than i have um so so the plus would not would not work with the double um i'm trying to remember now just use the two string um, okay um Oh, uh, I, I see the other, the issue is, is uh, unrelated. It's actually that I don't have the right includes here. Let me verify with file loader that this is actually the right one. Yes, print out, okay. So then in this case, it probably would have worked the first time around as well. So it's going to compile a new you know, it's going to compile the solenoid code. Um, it's putting this all back into this libepic directory. It's installing the libepic directory. 
in my local tree. Um, I could source this install setup again, but it presumably is still okay. Let me just source install setup. It, it, it's not going to make any difference if it was already loaded. Um, and if I now run DD web display with export, it should trigger that printout. Um, and it's actually printing out some information about the solenoid. Um, so the reason I did this here is, of course, not because I'm so interested in where the layers are for the solenoid, but to demonstrate that, um, that this is a way in which you can just make small changes to the geometry um, or even add debugging statements to the geometry and see the outputs of them appear here. Um, one of the things, of course, we want to do is, is prefer that these kind of statements are, are there um, when we actually run the, the simulations if, if those statements don't actually mean anything. In this case, I would not have, I should not have given this a warning code um, because there's, there's no warning presented here. This is a proper warning, and so it makes sense that that is a warning. Um, the debug level for this, this output would probably have been um, better chosen to be debug or so. Something we want to avoid, <clears throat> Sylvester, <clears throat> um, is, is these kind of printout statements um, that don't actually have a, a specific printout level. I think these are part of the tracking, right, Sylvester? I have no idea. They should not be there. Yeah, I think they're, they're at some point uh, going to disappear. Um, so, um, so with the type of detector that you've identified for yourself, um, try to do something similar. Just take a look at that, um, at that type and print out something, some variable, either a, a double or, or a number or a string, or it doesn't even have to be anything. Could be, uh, could be just text as well. Um, and see if with DD web display, it actually prints those, those values. Um, of course, we're not just going to want to use this with DD web display. Um, although it's a convenient little command that, um, that, that loads the geometry, um, we're going to want to run an actual simulation. And that's going to be the topic of next week's, um, uh, next week's tutorial. So, so ideally, of course, you would run this um, and then uh, you would make the changes, compile, um, have this in your local directory, and then run a simulation against that code. But that will be a very similar approach as running DD web display. The only difference will be we're going to run DD sim with that geometry file um, and you know it's not going to do anything because I need to specify more commands um, but uh, but that will be loading the same geometry in exactly the same way um, and it would also run those printout commands so so, um, so, so change the, the source file um, of the type that you selected earlier um, and add one of those printout statements, similar to the, the code that Nicholas um, posted there in the chat. And then recompile and rerun um, the DD web display and export. And I'm just going to show the diff here on my terminal of what I added. Um, so, so you have that for reference there as well.
uh, I want to ask one thing to Sylvester because uh, he the and to you. When I am running the simulation, previously I was getting x y z position as a double. Now I am getting some special objects like as for the position like of the DD for help. Now I cannot read outside the DD for help. So is it intentional? I print on the I sent on the chat box. How to access the position outside the DD for help? Um. So I think. You are um, you're probably writing to a regular uh, root file, right? Not with the extension edm for hep dot root. So okay. I would I would say try to write try to run the simulation with output to um, edm for hep dot root files. They have to end with edm for hep dot root. Let me just okay. edm for hep dot root. Um, in order to actually be written in the EDM for HEP format. Um, the format that you're writing in right now is just an internal, well, this is a, a non-standardized DD for HEP format, which we're not using. Anymore. Yeah, so the reason why it's changed is that we used to um, use our own EICD outputs and there we manually set it that it would, you know, right to our formats, but now we're using the EDM for HEP standard outputs um, that comes with uh, DD for HEP, which is why now we need to add an extra extension. Um, and then it should be in an identical uh, format than you're used to. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. That's why my code is not working. Previously, I tried uh, on the standard root file, and now I got this particular vector, this object. As always, we, we profusely apologize for any past and future breaking code. Okay, thank you. So next week, let's say I was trying to, what I was trying, I told you last time, I am trying to generate the simulation and then you have the hit points or Monte Carlo points, true points. Then I was trying to superimpose on the geometry it should really superimpose on the geometry. If it is not superimposing, that means something is uh, different between the geometry and the, uh, the hit specifically. This was I was trying, but I was not able to read the X, Y, Z position. Now I will superimpose it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you've... Uh... Um, recompiled and rerun the DD for the, the DD web display and, and you could indeed see the, the printout. Um, just give a thumbs up in the in the reaction so I know everyone's at that point. Now, of course, many of the changes that you'll make to this code um, might not be just adding printout statements, right? So, so probably the kind of changes you'll want to make are um, are adding a loop here or there, um, maybe adding layers, maybe adding slices, um, additional segmentation in the in the well, that would be an XML only thing, but um, additional layers that are sensitive. Um, in many cases, it may make sense to to sort of bounce off your ideas in a in an issue um, report on the uh, on the geometry repository because then it allows other people to comment on it, and we might be able to give you advice on, you know, is this a good idea? Is this uh, or or is that the more difficult way of doing things? Um, we also might be able to tell you if this is what you're doing, take a look at I don't know. Take a look at uh, the the forward um, ecal code because there's already something happening there that is very similar. Um, so so we certainly don't want to make it uh, difficult. We want to make it easy for you to be able to make those changes. Um, and uh, and we have a little bit of an overview that allows us 
to do that. So, so do make use of that rather than um, trying to do everything from scratch yourself. Um, so that about covers it for today. Um, let's see, what time is it? Um, are there any questions right now um, um, from anyone? Yes, I, I had one. Um, yep. So, so in in the class, for example, the calorimeter class, I saw the the sensitive uh, detector class that uh, can be set for these modules. And um, is this some, so I know when you run J on, usually you have to kind of define this like a sensitive detector class by hand, right? Or they have some like predefined scores. So, so what's actually being done here? Um, so, so you're looking in, um, in the, which one calorimeter? Um, like this homogeneous calorimeter. You right. Know. Oh, there's and then no there's detector. something called like sensitive detector. Uh, it seems yes. Like um, so there is a sensitive detector here. Let's see. Oh, this is adding. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we define things in, um, this is actually a, a very general um, class that allows you to to create any kind of um, colorimeter, whether it's in um, it's something that consists of lines of blocks, of disk a disk filled with blocks, um, or individual blocks with positions. Um, the sensitive detector um, that that is included here um, tells DD for HEP to treat this as something that will store hits, um, and the type tells it what kind of hits it will store. So, for example, for a, a colorimeter, it will take all of the energy depositions and turn that into one colorimeter hit per sensitive detector volume. For trackers, every individual JN4 hit is used as an output hit. So this sort of defines those two major types of hits. Um, in this case, the, the, the way that the code is set up is this sensitive detector part is it's set to send to colorimeters, but then each of the um, each of the different calls, whether you add lines or disks or something, um, is, is added to that sensitive to that list of sensitive detectors as well so that each of those blocks as they're placed is also um, turned into a sensitive detector. I don't know if so, that so answers. Yeah, yeah. So this calorimeter sensitive detector type is basically some predefined DD4 hem. Yes. So there's two types. Well, there's there's as many types as you want if we extend this, but uh, we use two types, the colorimeter type um, and uh, the tracker type. There's um, there's ways in which you can hard code this here. Um, there's also ways in which you can still change the type um, after the fact, and so um, on the runtime, um, which is what we do with, for example, the, um, the 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 photon sensitive detectors like the the rich. In that case, we're using a tracker here, even though we we then modify what is meant with tracker for that particular detector. Um, at runtime. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, so so right now the colorimeter is essentially defined as um, how much energy is deposited in the volume. That's one of the ways in which um, we can define these colorimeters. Another way which we can improve our um, our uh, our description of the colorimeters is actually um, look at light production in colorimeter blocks. Um, we could uh, we could do a full shower and then actually do uh, the determination of how much strength of light is generated or or for the case of, of scintillating colorimeters we could actually plug in the, the scintillating light yield and do optical physics tracking and um, that's another way in which we can you know treat this colorimeter so there are predefined types for optical or scintillator colorimeters that would allow us to uh, to improve that level of, of fidelity in a sense um, but they're always going to be Colorimeters, in the sense that ultimately the hits that we get out of it are are integrated types, uh, integrated quantities over all of the JN4 steps in that volume. Uh, the the trackers are not going to be integrated types, but they're going to be um, um, you know, individual hits, individual steps. And maybe one thing to add to that is that in principle for the colorimeter, um, you can optionally actually store 
all of the contributions to the hit as well. If you want to, you know, study a little bit more what particles actually contributed to these hits. Yeah, I think, I think we do default, by default. Yeah. We, we don't because it, it makes we the don't. files big unnecessarily. Yeah. At least um, I well, yeah, seemed to do that for the, like when we did that study with that insert H cow. It seemed to study to store all these contributions. Uh, although I, I'm not sure what was actually said in their class here. Hmm. The individual contributions in each 3D cell. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd have to, to verify whether it, it is all stored or not. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I will be posting those notes um, on on uh, Indico, hopefully by t by tonight, um, and turn them into uh, another um, sort of carpentry's tutorial type page like last week's. I guess also in those those XML file at the at the end when it actually defines the readout. Or maybe you plan on going over this next week. There, there's this ID tag, mm -hmm. um, and I never could understand what what that actually meant or whether it's important. Um, that's actually a good good time um, to go over that because I actually I wasn't planning on going over that. Um, I did talk a little bit about the system ID. So this is what um, what this is the ID number that each of the detector subsystems get. Um, so the way JN, uh, the way DD4 HEP stores hits or, or identifies in which detector component hits are stored is through this ID field. Um, it's a a 64-bit field um, that. Um, that contains a, a unique number that points back to the, the geometry element that where that head was generated. Um, so in this case, it includes eight bits for the system. So that means we can at most have 256 systems um, because if, if we have more than that, then uh, um, we'll, we'll not have enough bits here. Um, then eight bits for the ring, 20 bits for the module, um, eight for fiber X and eight for fiber Y. Um, that should add up to, um, that doesn't add up to 64, but I assume it's padded with, <laughs> with zeros at one end. Um, we probably should re review this. Um, yeah, so that's because, one way. Uh, in principle, we should do this differently. Let's show the one for the vertex tracker or something. That one is more standard. Yeah, I, I know we should uh, use one that actually looks right. So tracker. Um, uh silicon barrel or, or that one yeah uh, this one allows me to point out some other issue there um so in this case we're doing something very similar it's you know system again the same eight bits then because there's multiple layers in the, the silicon barrel um we we have an additional layer field we have a module field we have a sensor um field essentially one side or the other side of the plane um that's why two bits is, is sufficient and then inside that entire sensor we have an xy segmentation um, so in this case it's just a cartesian grid xy with um, 10 micron x 10 micron y pitch that's the pixels of the uh, uh, of the silicon barrel um, those x and y um, positions we give additional um, bits as well so now a particular 64 bit id will give us uniquely which system it was in um, and, and which layer module sensor but also which x and y pixel um, the hit came from um, and you'll see that uh, in this case we have uh, we should have 32 bits on this top half and then we have 32 bits on the bottom half where you know there's some some funny encoding happening here with the negative numbers but essentially um, 12 and, and 20 um, gives us the lower 32 bits um, of, of the hit. Uh, so we can do this on the, the Sagitta, we can do this on the outer silicon barrel hits. Um, these readout names are just what collection the hits then end up in, in the file. 
um, so um, most detectors that have modules like the um, like the colorimeters, like this homogeneous colorimeter, don't need this additional segmentation that uh, the XY um, grid gives us here. And all of the um, identifying information is, is in particular in this module number. Um, in the case of the um, of the tracking detectors, there's a lot of information that is also in this XY um, uh, pixel position within a sensor. I don't know if that that outlines a little bit how um, uh, Barak whether that answers a little bit your question. Uh, yeah, to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. So the so a couple of other things to point out is that this particular one or segmentation type is called Cartesian grid XY, which means that we do overlay an XY grid on top of whatever geometry we have. So we don't actually need to make sensors that size. We just overlay a grid of 10 microns. And then the, syn the syntax for the ID, uh, you see after the X, it says 32. That means that we're skipping to the last 32 bits, regardless of what we put before. Um, so in case that whatever comes before doesn't add up to, to 32, we still you know, nicely put the, the final segmentation in the, in the second half of the the, the long essentially. Um, so we skip to the last 32 bits and then we say we have assigned um, 12 bits and assigned 20 bits for Y. The reason that they're 12 and 20 and not say 16 and 16 is that these are narrow long bars and we need actual the 20 signed bits to really address the Y direction properly. While the X direction is pretty narrow so we don't need that much bit depth. If you get that wrong, you'll get errors during the simulation. May I ask? And unfortunately, you won't get any hints in those errors as to why. <laughs> oh, I can say something here. Can I say something? So when I handle the cylindrical layer in Giant or any geometry manager, what I will do, uh, I will take the X dimension or one dimension as a fixed dimension. Then we have the R5 dimension. We have to specify the angles of the pixels. Then it generates the pixels over the circles. But here we have the X, Y, how it is generating the same size pixels. That is. That well, we but in Jan 4, when you're defining a R5, um, you know, we don't make silicon detectors that are, well, okay, I'll take that back in a second here for the vertex tracker, but we don't make silicon sensors that aren't flat. They're all flat. They're, the, the, these silicon detectors are flat and they have an XY direction. We could have treated this as a cylindrical R5 direction, um, but that would have required that we have a, an incorrect model for or tracking detector, which is an actual cylinder. That's an approximation. The correct geometry is, is a flat sensor. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. I was not aware. Thank you. Yeah, here we're actually building staves that are, you know, somewhat tiled together to form the barrel. Okay, thank you. But there's also yeah. an RFI segmentation if you want to use that one. There's a, there's a, I think, 15 or so different segmentation types predefined. And mm -hmm. maybe we may, for some detectors, we may need to define our own going forward at some point. Right. Yeah, so the, the, the definition of the, the geometry plugin that, uh, that we looked at, that is essentially how everything is defined in, um, in DD4HEP. Uh, everything is a plugin. Um, if you want to define a new physics list, it's a plugin. If you want to define a new um, sensitive detector type, as, as Chris, for example, is has, has now familiar with, um, it's a plugin. If you want to define a new segmentation, it's going to be a, a similar plugin. It's essentially a function that does one thing, and you can decide to use it inside an XML code, or you can decide not to use it in an XML code. Um, and so you're just writing that one little bit of support to add functionality through these plugins, which makes it actually pretty extensible with that kind of functionality. So adding a what was it? A hexagonal segmentation that we discussed. Um, it, it's it's a matter of writing a plugin of of uh, of, of uh, similar complexity as the XY plugin. Well, maybe a little more.
Okay, I'm going to stop the recording here. And